History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 72, Spanish Renaissance Theatre, Part 1, The Beginnings of a National Drama. Last time, we saw French dramatists struggle as they worked through different forms of theatre in the short French Renaissance period. The desire of many leading thinkers to adhere to Aristotle's unities was the biggest point of contention between different dramatists. But still, only the opening shots in an even longer debate, to which the Renaissance period did not see any conclusion. As we move our gaze south to Spain, we find a somewhat different situation, as far as creativity in the theatre is concerned, by the time we get to the early Renaissance, which is something of a surprise. But before I get to that, I think it's worth taking a step or two back in time to summarise the situation in Spain prior to the Renaissance. Up to this point in the podcast, developments of Spanish theatre have only been mentioned as part of the homogenous Roman and medieval developments, and most of the information and specific examples for these periods came from further north in the continent. However, Spain did have some individual aspects to the development of theatre that are worthy of particular mention, and which influenced the Renaissance theatre in Spain. So to start with, here's something of a reminder of previous periods, with a particular reference to Spain. Until quite recently, scholarship on Spanish theatre fell into two distinct camps. One group of scholars held that the Spanish theatre evolved from liturgical and semi-liturgical drama, and speculate that it was born together with locally composed poetry at the very beginnings of Spanish literature. The opposing thought was that Spanish drama developed directly from the classical model, going back to the Roman occupation of the Iberian Peninsula. Some have even suggested that there was influence directly from the Greek theatres that pre-existed the Roman model. Now that view rather downplayed the type of evolution of theatre that we've seen in Northern Europe, and while some direct influence of Greek and Roman theatre is not denied, a more nuanced view is generally held in more recent scholarship, where the Spanish theatre that emerges from the medieval period is seen as more of a blending of the religious and ritualistic theatre with the secular classical theatre. Some scholarship argues that that blending was more overtly seen in Spain than anywhere else in Europe. The evidence for theatre in the Greek colonies on the Spanish peninsula is good, so the Greek influence is now accepted as the first strand of a continuum that takes us through the Renaissance and beyond. There are remains of a Greek theatre near modern-day Valencia that show drama was active in the 3rd century BCE. The Romans then put their stamp on the country, which included building more theatres. The end of the Roman period in the 5th century CE didn't see an end to theatre, as the new rulers, the Germanic Visigoths, continued to use Greek and Roman-built theatres for their own entertainment, which included theatre, and of course the by then popular mime and pantomime in the Roman manner. There was even some evidence that the Visigoths built their own theatres in the Roman style in wood. Roman-style farce, mime and acrobatic entertainments continued to be played and over the next three centuries, with the advance of Christianity, became entertainment to be performed only on holy and celebratory days rather than purely as a secular entertainment. For a time then, Spain was more or less in line with the rest of Europe as far as religious and secular theatre went. But a significant decline in Spanish theatre came with the invasion of the Arabs in 711 CE. Their dislike of mimetic art was strong, and their sensibilities tended towards the scientific and pragmatic rather than representational art, and they pushed the actors and the entertainers north as they swept up the country from the south. Only a thin band of Christian rule was left in the far north of the Iberian Peninsula and led to very unsettled conditions for an extended period. Although the Arabs were slowly pushed back south until they only remained in the southern region they called Al-Andalus, centred on the great capital of Granada, that process of reconquest took until the early 13th century. Over the next century, small Muslim states in the north and the centre of the peninsula were taken over by Christian princes, and that fight gradually became less about Christian versus Arab and more about prince versus prince. The kingdoms of Aragon in the northeast and Castile in the northwest emerged as the main players on the peninsula, and between them absorbed other smaller states into a system of more or less self-governing confederacies ruled by the same king. 
Aragon, with its absorbed region of Catalonia, had a stable and effective royal dynasty until 1410, and as a result became a sophisticated trading nation whose successes were only curtailed in the mid-14th century with the arrival of the Black Death and its decimating effect on the population. Castile took a different path. From 1230, they absorbed the Kingdom of Leon through conquest, and then developed a state where monarchy, the nobility, the military and the church all had close ties, mostly thanks to their need to focus on the reconquest of the Arab lands. As a reward for funding that reconquest, the king granted large tracts of lands to the nobility and to the church, and by the 14th century, that led to a complex relationship between the crown, the nobility and the church not so dissimilar from the struggles of the English kings at that time with their powerful barons. The Castilian monarchs were removed and replaced frequently, and the state was therefore less stable than their main rivals. However, the relative stability of and between the two main powers on the peninsula did mean that by the later 14th century, as they recovered from the effects of the Black Death, the two kingdoms were outward-looking and primed to become major players in the political and economic life of Europe of the Renaissance. Despite the often hostile conditions and the Arab influences, secular theatre in Spain was kept alive in the late Middle Ages, albeit mostly by the jugglers and the clowns, who continued the mimetic tradition with scenic entertainments, mimes and mocking plays, the inheritor of the Roman Ludi. The short comic skit depicting persons of low station was typically obscene, even sacrilegious, and relied heavily on slapstick humour. Evidence of secular plays is sparse, but we get a hint that they were popular from laws written in 1252 and 1257 by Alfonso X, King of Castile. These new laws allowed for religious plays to continue but banned secular plays, hence the inference that the secular plays were a bit too popular for the liking of the authorities. There's a specific mention of plays performed in Toledo in 1252, where comic actors mocked clerics, and in which churchmen also performed. Perhaps it's not too difficult to see why that, given the close relationship between church and state, was problematic. Evidence of the existence of medieval religious drama in Spain is also quite sparse, but there is enough to say that we can speculate with some confidence that Spanish religious drama followed more or less the European pattern. The movement of clergy between parishes and monastic groups was, once again, the most likely means by which new ideas about including drama in the church service travelled to the continent. The trope of the three Marys at the tomb of Jesus in the Easter Mass, the Quim Quiretes, is documented in Valencia in 1432, but it is possible that it had been used there since at least 1360. As in other parts of Europe, the dialogue developed to include extra-liturgical embellishments, so that it is considered to be the bridge whereby medieval culture makes a transition from ritual to representational drama. Spain then made its first unique contribution to theatre with the development of the one-act liturgical play that became known as Auto. These developed the concepts of the Quimquarates, extended them and took them out of the direct context of the Mass. These short plays presented a simple message on a religious subject, often relating to a particular sacrament of the Church and played in an allegorical form, foreshadowing the more complex morality plays of later years in Northern Europe. Performance of the autos was firmly attached to the celebratory days and processions of Christmas Eve, Easter, Epiphany and, more latterly, to the Corpus Christi feast day. This stepping stone between the Quimquarates and the cycle plays isn't evidenced in the rest of Europe, but in Spain, numerous anonymous autos in the vernacular and belonging to the Christmas and Easter cycles are known to have existed. However, only a 147-line fragment of the play of the Three Kings from 1200 has been preserved. Probably written in southwest France, close to the Spanish border, the work shows dramatic promise ahead of its time, and is equal to many works that appeared almost three centuries later. This fragment was discovered in 1785 in the cathedral at Toledo. The text is derived from either the liturgy for Epiphany or the liturgy for Christmas Eve, both of which were in use in the French church at the time. It retells the story of the adoration of the Magi as found in the Gospel of Matthew. 
The structure and style show evidence of characteristics that continued to be used in Spanish plays right up to those of the 17th century. There is use of three different poetic metres, soliloquies and rhetorical questions. Episodes are arranged into a climactic order. There is natural dialogue and a swiftness of action, as well as individual characterisation. The drama appears to open part way through the action of the play, with earlier actions being recalled and reported on, and, not insignificantly, there is use of astrology within the theme. It's only one quite short fragmentary example, but much has been extrapolated from it. The church, monastic cloisters and universities kept the Latin theatrical tradition alive in the 11th and 13th century, when plays were produced in Latin and later in Spanish as the vernacular took over. As education grew and the well-to-do looked for more sophisticated dramas for their leisure time entertainment, the comedies of Plautus and imitations written in Latin verse became popular. At the University of Salamanca, founded in 1243, the teaching of Latin included Roman comedies and tragedies which the teachers and students sometimes performed. They also wrote imitations of their own in Latin. From near the end of the 12th century, we have an anonymous Latin comedy, Pamphilus in Love, which continued to be read until the 16th century and almost certainly influenced the Renaissance dramatists. The comedy is Tarantine in style and also shows influence from Ovid, to whom it was incorrectly attributed to for a while. It is a dramatic poem with a five-act structure and four characters. In it, Pamphilus calls on the goddess Venus and a crafty old hag to help him in his efforts to seduce the beautiful Galatia. By the 14th century, plays dealing with the birth and death of Christ, which was performed in churches and in church courtyards, found strong competition in the elaborate Corpus Christi festivals in Catalonia and Valencia. Religious bodies and trade guilds assembled sacred scenes and tableaus, often on an Old Testament subject, which became part of the moving procession in the streets. Within 50 years, this tradition was adopted by other towns for their religious festivals, where wagons were constructed to carry around characters dressed as angels and saints, and who spoke dialogues as they travelled through the town. These were the Spanish version of the cycle play, but were also different from the autos, so distinct in their own right. The processional element of these productions was particularly important in Spain, and the religious procession remains an important feature of cultural life in some parts of Spain right up to today. During the Spanish medieval period, a poetic form developed that fed into the development of dramatic art. The poetry was structured around a dispute between two characters. Their intention was to discuss the relative merits of an ethical problem. Some of these took allegorical form, but on the whole, and for the time, they were generally very free of any rules. A fragment of the dispute between the soul and the body, written towards the end of the 12th century, depicts an argument between the body and the soul of a dead man, who blame each other for the sins he committed in life. It's another theme that will have a long life in Spanish drama and literature, featuring in work through to the 17th century. A similar work from the 13th century, The Dispute Between Helen and Mary, has two young ladies arguing about the merits of a clergyman and a knight as prospective husbands. The Book of Spiritual Love was produced in the same form nearly a century later by one Juan Ruiz from Castile. His poetic dialogue presents an allegorical debate between the carnival in the personage of Don Carnal and Lent, portrayed by Donna Curesma. Lent defeats her enemy on Ash Wednesday, but by Easter Sunday he has regained control. In some respects, Spain was late to the theatrical party. The combination of the religious, the popular, profanity and the philosophical thought in drama had been popular much earlier elsewhere in Europe, but it doesn't appear in Spain until the beginning of the 15th century. And when it did, it was in the form of a satirical dialogue called The Dance of Death. Other examples follow, with the tradition continuing through the century, with works like The Doggerel of Mingo Revolgo in 1464, which used rustic language as two shepherds criticised the king, Henry IV, and his ministers. The same court was criticised in The Doggerel of the Provincial, 
and similarly almost current affairs are covered in A Play About Ponza, written in 1444 about the naval defeat of the combined forces of Navarre and Aragon by the Genoese fleet. Several ingredients in these medieval dialogues influence the development of future Spanish drama. Since the rhetorical exercises ended with the resolution of a conflict between the protagonists, a dramatic plot evolved, together with specific characterization of people. That element of debate intensifies the conflict and gives the dramatic situation to the characters, who are also given the opportunity to express their emotional state. While clashing with their opponents, they display indecision, disharmony, and finally adjustment to the agreed position of the resolution. These features are inherently dramatic and naturally found their way into later drama. The first extant and complete Spanish drama to survive comes from the second half of the 15th century, the play about the birth of our Lord. It dates from between 1467 and 1481 and was written by Gómez Manrique. He was born about 1412 and after a military career rose to be a local administrator in Toledo. He's remembered now for his poetry that was not printed until 1885. His play is known to have been staged by nuns at a convent between 1467 and 1481, and Manrique also wrote a passion play called Lamentations for Holy Week. Similarly interesting early work was produced by Inigo de Mendoza about 1480. He was a writer and a poet at the court of Castile right at the end of the 15th century. Called simply The Life of Christ, his play is again the nativity story, but in this version, two angels hold a dialogue with four shepherds, explaining the significance of recent events before they guide them to the manger. The piece was probably intended to be read dramatically rather than performed on stage, and is now particularly noted for its use of rustic language and the way in which it fuses comic and sacred elements. Secular drama in Spain continued to develop into the 15th century, despite the objection of the church and some legislation against it. Festivities that we've come across before make their way to Spain too. The New Year's celebration, the Feast of Fools, where the junior clergy took over senior roles for the day, was also celebrated in Spain, and Saints' Days became important days for local celebrations, including plays about the local saint. The royal courts also participated in processions and celebrations for weddings and anniversaries, a habit that was quickly copied by the nobles on a similar scale. Pageants and masquerades became common and grew into elaborate performances that included pantomimic songs, burlesque dances and masked players, who presented allegorical versions of important historical and civic events relevant to the location of their performance. So at the close of the medieval period in Spain, theatre as either dramatic ritual or social entertainment had survived, despite attempts to limit it for social and religious reasons. But it was only at the dawn of the Renaissance period that the idea that Spanish theatre could be an important literary form really came into its own. As successful traders, people from Spanish kingdoms travelled widely and soon came into contact with the Italian Renaissance. From the 14th century, the Italian comedy and short story became popular in Spain and influenced the development of the Spanish language and prompted new interest in theatre. When the Italian theatrical troops came to Spain in the middle of the 16th century with their well-advanced dramatic art, they persuaded the Spaniards to imitate aspects of their style. They pressed the need to move the performance of theatre away from the religious feast days and to modernise the stage. The Spaniards also followed the Italian lead by allowing women to perform on stage, and during this time the Spanish nobility also began to follow the example of the Italian dukes by becoming patrons for dramatists. The Italian humanistic plays influenced the writing of similar works, such as Inigo de Mendoza's Andalusian Story from 1492, where we see him moving away from the religious plays. The Andalusian story was written in Latin, but on a Spanish subject. The move of plays into the vernacular happened relatively quickly in Spain, and right at the start of the trend, one of the most important works in the history of Spanish literature was produced. The tragicomedy of Callisto and Melibia is based on the medieval romance and reflects the moral attitudes of that period. 
Over time, the play has become known as Celestina, after its central character. The Renaissance version is of uncertain date, but something near the very end of the 15th century is generally accepted. The confusion arises because of a printed edition that was originally thought to have been published in 1499 in Burgos. However, in 1951, the final page that contains that date was re-examined, and due to the fact that the paper it was printed on was the product of the 18th century, it was found to be a forgery. Given this uncertainty about the edition, the honour of being the official oldest surviving edition now goes to one printed just a year later in Toledo. In this version, the play has 16 acts and a postscript in the form of a letter from the playwright, which acknowledges his debt to the earlier anonymous autos from Salamanca. This edition from Toledo includes some opening acrostic verses, where the first letter of each line spells the name of the author, in this case, Fernando de Rojas. He was born about 1465 and was studying law when he wrote the play in the late 1490s. It's unlikely that the play was ever staged in his lifetime, and indeed, at the time it was probably thought of more as a dramatic poem or dialogue to be given as a performed reading rather than as a play. But in later years, it was adapted and embellished and is now generally seen as a play in its own right. A note from a publisher in a slightly later edition suggests that some attempts to perform the piece had been attempted, but without great success, and in his view, it was best performed as a piece to be read aloud, not staged. Little is known of the life of Rojas other than that he came from a Jewish family and converted to Christianity, or possibly that his family had done so in the past. The terminology used in the records can have either meaning. Although being Jewish wouldn't have barred him from practising law at the time, it was a time of prejudice against the Jewish communities, and conversion or marriage into a Christian family would have helped his standing. He seems to have been involved in a court case concerning his father, who was also a lawyer, which may have been prompted by some of the anti-Semitic tendencies of the time. Celestina tells the tragic love story of the young couple Callisto and Melibia who in pursuit of their love are aided by their servants and an old go-between, Celestina. Their parents do not approve, and their affair comes to a tragic end when Callisto falls from a high garden wall, and Melibia, learning of her lover's demise, throws herself from a tower to join him in death. The drama in the play comes from the differences shown between the idealism of the young lovers and the realism of Celestina and the servants. Not only are these two worlds, the idealistic and the realistic, shown as irreconcilable, but actually in direct opposition with each other. The idealistic but unrealistic lovers are set up in opposition to the base and carnal realism of the world of the servants. The themes of morality, pessimism, renunciation and a lack of freedom for the individual are typical medieval themes, and in that sense the play has been called the last play of the medieval period. But the play also upholds ideas of the unrestrained enjoyment of love and the celebration of beauty, which place it more comfortably in the Renaissance. It is also a very salacious and bawdy play at times. Callisto is no chaste lover, but a lustful and shrewd player. Celestina enjoys her role as the deceptive go-between, taking on something like the role of a pimp. Rojas wrote of the practical problems of dealing with boards with a confidence that suggests considerable practical experience on his part, and it was a style and subject that others were to take up. Shortly after the publication of Celestina, three anonymous works that are clearly influenced by it appear. These were followed by prose and poetic and dramatic works in the next decades that were adaptations, continuations and reworkings of the same play. It remained popular through these, and really is the bridge in Spain between the medieval and the Renaissance, and we will come across it again specifically in the theatre of Spain as we move forward. The very first dramatist to become influenced by the Italian Renaissance was Juan del Encina. He was enamoured with the Italian comedies in Latin, and created Spanish versions that were nationalistic, realistic and popular. Where Rojas still had one foot in the past, Encina was able to step fully into the present and embrace the opportunities that the Renaissance provided. But this was courtly theatre, 
presented for the entertainment of his patrons, the Duke of Alba and Cardinal Arabia in Rome. Born about 1468, Encina was the son of a shoemaker. Despite poor beginnings, he attended the University of Salamanca and was taken into the household of the Duke of Alba soon after. He entertained the Duke and his guests with poetry and dramatic prose readings, but also turned his hand to playwriting. His career as a playwright can be divided into three parts. At first, he continued in the medieval traditions. In 1492, he wrote a shepherd's play, which is very typical of the cycle plays. His second period began with the play of the Great Rains, which included elements of farce and ridicule borrowed from the clowns and comics of the day. In his farcical play The Hair Pulling Skirt, he goes even further and produces humorous dialogue between two shepherds who joke about how they became victims of a fight with some students in Salamanca. Their dialogue is completely in the local dialect and has all the rustic vulgarity that you could possibly hope for. That particular feature was picked up by later playwrights who almost always turned to rustic characters speaking in dialect when their aim was to create a bit of low comedy. In the third phase, best represented by his The Play of Placida and Vittoriano, he shows off his newfound influences from Italy and understanding of the complexity and sophistication of Italian comedy. As his most ambitious work, it is the reworking of Italian adaptations of a Roman comedy. When Placida commits suicide because she has been rejected by Vittoriano, he considers ending his own life, but is stopped by the goddess Venus who brings Placida back to life. The play becomes the basis for several later versions by dramatists who, like Encina, became immersed in the Renaissance thinking and turned back to the classical myths and legends to find means to express renewed ideas. Lucas Fernandez began his playwriting career as a devotee of Encina's. It's even possible that they worked together as master and pupil, but at its height Fernandez was certainly a serious rival. Born in about 1472 in Salamanca, he wrote in the dialect of Leon, the northern region of Spain. He was a churchman rising to be abbot in his local church and a musician. Six of his plays survive, which are a mix of religious and pastoral pieces, but all include a thorough mixing of prose dialogue, poetry and song and dance within the play. His Easter play, The Play of the Passion, is considered his best, but his pastorals are some of the earliest examples of a particularly Spanish form of drama, Zarzuela. In its developed state from about 1630, this form took a mix of the mask musical theatre and the comic play and integrated the singing and dancing with the dramatic action of the piece. Music was written for both solo performances and choruses and scored for an orchestra. In this early form, it wasn't quite opera but a very early example of music and song being truly integrated into a narrative drama. But of Fernandez, although his works were very popular at the time and contain the odd heartfelt moment when they deal with matters of love and honour, we can say that generally his works perhaps focus too much on the music and possess only slight dramatic action, with characters drawn rather shallowly. The continuing influence of Plautus again rears its head in the works of Bartolomé de Torres Naro. He had spent his early life as a soldier before taking holy orders, and his 1510 play, Military Comedy, mixes classical Plautus and his experiences as a man in the ranks. It is a five-act play, but all the action is revealed in dialogues as a braggart Spanish captain recruits men for the service of the Pope in Italy. Six years later, he wrote the much more farcical piece The Servant's Mess Hall. By this time he'd moved to Rome and satirised the corruption he found there by depicting the life of the people in the service of a senior cardinal. His comedy sent up the manners and social attitudes of the time, but had a satirical and political bite to it. After The Servant's Mess Hall and The Triumphant Comedy, which takes a swipe at the nobility and the clergy, he tried his hands at rewriting Celestina and produced The Play of the Hymen, considered by some to be the best play of the period. He changed the plot to have a happy ending, with a brother defending his family's honour and persuading his sister's suitor to marry her. His version of the play increases the focus on the love intrigue in the plot and highlights the importance of feminine honour and the chivalric behaviour of men. As such, it is the first in a line of plays that became known as cloak-and-sword plays. 
The name refers to the typical costume of the time, reflecting the street clothes of the usual heroes of the plays, students, soldiers, and the gentleman soldier, the cavalier. This particular form really comes into its own a little later in the story, but the exponents then recognise their debt to this earlier piece. Besides his plays, Narrow also wrote on the theory of theatre. In a prologue to his collected plays published in Naples in 1517, he classified drama into two groups, the realistic play that dealt with customs and social habits, and imaginative plays, or those that told a story of intrigue. He supported the belief in the five-act model as the perfect form for drama, and suggested that a cast should never exceed twelve characters. Perhaps not surprisingly, as a churchman, he advocated the portrayal of truthfulness in characters and adherence to decorum at all times. The collected plays, actually just eight of a much larger output and his introduction, had a miraculous survival. The edition was called Pro Palladia, The First Things of Pallas, and only existed in one known copy held in the Royal Dutch Library. This was stolen from there in the 1970s and was lost for 30 years until it came up for auction at Christie's in London in 2003. On investigation, it emerged that it was the relatives of the original thief who were trying to sell the work. Narrow was no expert in stagecraft. His theatre relied on the text more than dramatic action. But his satire was sharp and his characters lively, if ill-defined, and his humour rude and boisterous, for all of his expressed wish that decorum must be maintained on stage. What marks him out from his contemporaries is the way he mixed high and low characters, and made his plays, secular and religious, appeal to a broad section of society. He captured different aspects of human nature in his plays, and showed men and women in realistic situations that he then turned on occasion to his satiric purposes. He also had an eye for the romantic, which was just one of the ways he foreshadowed what was to come in Spanish theatre when the Golden Age really got going. By the end of the 15th century, Spain was well on the way to producing some of the finest plays of the Renaissance period, the theatrical activity expanding to include a renewed interest in tragedy and the development of a romantic form of theatre concerned with chivalry and love. In the meantime, on the Patreon feed, there is an extra episode in the Henslow's Diary series where I take a look at the affair of the Isle of Dogs. Not the area of South London on the Thames estuary, but a play by Ben Johnson and Thomas Nash that may have been responsible for the closure of London theatres in the summer of 1597. If you'd like to hear about that, then please join up at www.patreon.com slash thoetp for a small monthly fee. I've put a link in the show notes. Thanks everyone for your continued support, be that on Patreon or just by listening to the podcast. Please do spread the word and help others to find us here. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.